Welcome to C3 San Diego. Need something fresh, real, and powerful in your life? Connect with us on social media, get live stream service notifications, podcasts, and up-to-date information on upcoming events. We are so glad you're joining us for a powerful, life-transforming message from one of our C3 San Diego pastors. We would love to hear about how God is impacting your life through this ministry. Please share your experience with us at info at c3sandiego.com. If you'd like to be a part of what C3 Church is doing in the city of San Diego and beyond, you can contribute financially by going to c3give.com and choosing the giving option that works best for you. We hope you enjoy this message. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hey, do this with me, do this with me. Take your left hand, reach over your right shoulder, pull down, and click. (laughs) Tell your neighbor, buckle up, Dorothy. (laughs) Kansas is going bye-bye. Tell the other neighbor, but you better buckle up. (laughs) Give someone a high five. Tell them they are really, really ridiculously (laughs) good-looking. You may be seated. Can we thank the musicians and the singers again? I thought you guys did a fabulous job. Deshaun and beautiful Augusta and McKenna, my favorite, and Jasmine and just the great team up there. You guys were awesome. Absolutely fantastic. The title of my message tonight, we're going to jump straight into it, is The Impossible Exchange. The Impossible Exchange. Uh, I've been saved for 32 years. I've been reading the Bible for 32 years. If you would have said, you've been reading the same book, yep, for 32 years, yep. I've got to tell you, the, the story tonight, the message tonight comes out of a passage I've read. I can't even tell you how many times I've read this story. And uh, God spoke to me and said, do you see me? In this story, do you see Jesus? Do you see salvation? And I'm telling you, I, I honestly would tell you, I don't have a religious bone in my body. And then all of a sudden, I felt I was blinded by even religiosity that had crept in. Because to me, even God speaking that seemed anathema, seemed like it couldn't possibly be. So let me pray. And uh, we'll get into it, the impossible exchange. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this word, and I ask that you would speak through me. Holy Spirit, I I preached it twice today, and neither, neither time did I feel like I delivered it to them the way I heard it from you. So help me tonight, Father, to, to speak it to these beautiful people, that they would begin to see a glimpse of the gravity, the majesty, the wonder, the awe, of this impossible exchange in jesus name amen amen all right now we're going to do some heavy upfront bible reading because i've got to kind of put it in context otherwise it's not going to make sense so first corinthians 15 verse 45 in the niv first corinthians 15 45 in the niv the niv the nearly inspired version it says, so it is written, the first Adam, the first man, Adam, became a living being, but the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. The first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, the last Adam, the second Adam, is Jesus. There are only ever two human beings born without, our sin, without a sinful nature. Only one born without a belly button. Adam didn't have a belly button. Jesus did. But both of them, they're the only two figures in human history ever to be born without a sinful nature. So the Bible calls Adam the first Adam, but it calls Jesus the last Adam or the second Adam all the way through the Scripture. This is really important. So now let me me go back. In Genesis chapter 1, it was God's idea to create man. And he says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Verse 27, God created man in his image and his likeness. And then Genesis 28, and the Lord blessed them. And the Lord blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Everyone say increase. God wants your life to increase. God wants you to flourish. God wants you to prosper. I just need you to settle that. And, you know, for 12 years, we've kind of kept a little bit of heat now. But now just, they just kind of bounce off. So I couldn't couldn't really care less because I know what the Bible says. So, you know, pastor, you preach in that prosperity gospel. All I know is the gospel and it's full of prosperity. 
it's full of prosperity. So this is, this is before Adam has graduated from Harvard. In fact, Harvard didn't exist. This is before, you know, Aaron, uh, Adam, before Adam ran with Leanne in a marathon and completed a marathon. He hasn't, he hasn't completed a marathon. He hasn't, you know, qualified for the Olympic Games. He hasn't gone to the Winter Olympics and done the <laughs> sweeping game. He hasn't done anything. He's just kind of just breathing. And God blessed him and said, be fruitful and multiply. God's will, God's intention is for you to increase. God's intention for your life is for you to flourish, for you to prosper, for you to expand, for you to be fruitful and multiply. But here's the key. God gives you the power and it's his blessing. God wants you to live with his blessing. Now, how many people know that God sticks Adam in a garden and tells him you can eat of all these trees except for one? One tree is my tree. Don't eat of it. He's got thousands of trees to choose from. But what does he do? He eats from the one that he's not meant to. So in Genesis 3.17, the Bible says, God says to Adam, because you have done this, watch this, cursed be the ground. God couldn't curse Adam because God blessed him. Did you see that? Genesis 1, 28, and God blessed him. God cannot curse what he has already blessed. God doesn't bless what he's already cursed. All right, so, so let, me, let me help you. God is the most powerful being in the universe, and yet God is a respect. If he has blessed something, he will not curse it. So even though Adam, even though man sinned, God said, cursed be the ground for your sake. So the ground is cursed. God wants you to live with blessing, but now there's a, there's a curse in motion. There is a curse in operation in the earth. You, you hear this when people say, man, life is just difficult. Man, life is a constant struggle. I feel like I'm taking two steps forward and one step back. Maybe there are people watching online and this is like a, your testimony. It's like, man, I just, no matter how hard I try, it's never enough. It, no matter how many raises or promotions I get, there's always something that goes wrong. The, the engine blows up on the car or a tire explodes or something always goes wrong. There's a, a leaking pipe or the roof or something. There's always something. Extra money comes in and it goes out as quickly as it comes in. I just can't seem to get ahead. Sometimes it can feel like life is against you. Well, the Bible teaches us that there is a curse in play. There is a curse in play. The Bible does teach us too that, uh, that the curse can be overcome. I'm not sure if you realize that. So the reason that we preach tithing, well, I understand, Pastor, you preach tithing because that's how the church funds itself. Because without the tithe, you can't pay the bills. And while there's an element of that that is true, the, the, the reason that we teach you to tithe is because the Bible says that when, when we bring the first tenth, when we put God first, God says this. He says, test me now in this, says the Lord, if I will not throw open the windows of heaven, pour out such blessing. Now he's cursed the earth. He says to Adam, because you've sinned, Cursed be the ground for your sake, thorns and thistles it'll produce for you. And out of the sweat of your brow and out of the labor and toil, the earth will yield to you its increase. So God says there's a better way. And I used to live with 100% of my income fighting a curse, wondering why I could never make it, wondering why I could never pay my bills, wondering why I could never get ahead. Then I come into church and some, some pastor up here had the audacity to tell me that I could go further on 90% than I couldn't if I wasn't making it on 100%. But then as I began to read the scripture, he says that me putting God first, me bringing the first, me bringing the 10th opens the windows of heaven. So I don't got to look to the earth that is cursed, that has got toil, that has got labor, that has got thorns and thistles. There is a new flow. And then God says, I'll open the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing, there's not room enough to receive it. Now I've got to tell you this, for 31 and a half years, and it took me about six months to get there, for 31 and a half years, Leanne and I have been faithfully tithing. 
faithfully tithing because I've seen God with 90% of my income with the blessing of heaven. Do you know the Bible says, Proverbs 13, 22, it's the blessing of the Lord that makes one rich and adds no sorrow with it. When the blessing of God is upon your life, there is a power, there is a supernatural power. Now, the reason God says, I'll pour out so much blessing, there's not room enough to receive it is because in your life and my life, there ain't meant to be room enough to receive it. You and I are meant to be blessed to be a blessing. David wrote in Psalm 23, He anointeth my head with oil and my cup runneth over. When he writes that my cup runneth over, it's not that when God starts pouring, it gets distracted. It's not that God likes stained tablecloths. I think I'll just keep pouring till it spills over and stains the tablecloth. The reason that his cup runneth over is so the people with empty cups can bring their cup and get filled up from your overflow. And then they begin to say, how come, how come you all got this? Where'd you get this flow that your cup runneth over? And you can say, it's because the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pasture. You can begin to testify that God is good. So we see that there are blessings and cursings in, in operation. The next thing that we begin to see is we begin to see that, that there, is, there is a disqualification. My, my humanity disqualifies me from divinity. People say, well, you know, I think that I'm going to heaven because I, I'm not as bad as that guy. And we can all think of that guy. We can all think of some Jack the Ripper kind of guy. Well, I'm not as bad as that guy. And, you know, and... You know, that's kind of a little bit of a gamble. Like, you know, if you're in line getting into heaven and you're waiting, you know, judgment day and you, you kind of can see Peter up there and you're like, oh, you know, okay, won't be too much longer now. And, uh, you know, hopefully the Jack the Ripper guy's in front of you because you look so good. <laughs> but, you know, if there's this short little lady this high in front of you and you're thinking, well, you know, past the time, I might as well introduce myself. Hi, you know, my name's Jürgen. What's your name? Teresa. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> And what did you do on planet Earth? Oh, you built orphanages in Calcutta. Oh, sugar. <laughs> You're not Mother Teresa, are you? Anybody want to change places? No one's going to change places in the line with you. First offering in the Bible was Cain and Abel. First murder in the Bible was Cain and Abel. The Bible says it comes to pass in the fullness of time that Cain brings an offering to the Lord, watch this, of the first fruits from the ground, the fruit of the ground. Abel doesn't bring anything from the ground. The Bible says Abel goes to his flock and he takes the firstborn lamb and he brings it to God. Both men bring an offering. An offer is just an offer. It doesn't have to be accepted. And God looks at Cain, says no. And he looks at Abel and says yes. And the blessing of God comes on Abel, but no blessing on Cain. Because the earth was cursed. And Cain was making a statement before God that I can produce in my ability, in my strength, something that pleases you. Whereas Abel said, I realize no matter how hard I try, I cannot attain perfection. A sacrifice must be made in order to please you. So we see this in play. We see this in play where the, the older brother, Cain, and the younger brother, there's a conflict. And all the way through the Bible, the younger shall rule over the older. It's because the second Adam, Jesus, will fix up the mistakes of the first Adam, Adam. This is all the way through the Bible. Now come with me to uh, uh, one last scripture. Genesis 25, 28 says this. It says that Isaac loved Esau because. Everyone say because. Because he ate of his gain. But Rebekah loved Jacob. Isaac loved Esau because performance-based acceptance. Rebekah just loved Jacob. Now come Genesis 27. This is the reading part, and then I'm going to unpack it for you. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, he said, here I am. He says, behold, now I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow and go out into the field and hunt game for me. 
and make me savory food such as I love and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went out into the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I'll make savory food from them for your father such as he loves." Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man and I'm smooth skin. Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall shall seem to be a deceiver to him and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. Now, let me just kind of stop there. So Esau, his name means red. When he was born, he was red and hairy. Possibly the first of the Scotsmen. He's so red and hairy, aye. And he was a hunter of, of fine game. He went out into the field and he hunted with his bow and arrow and his weapons. And he'd shoot pheasants and duck and venison, bring it to his father. And he'd say, Father, I've made something for you. And his father would say, oh, that smells good. What is it? What do you call that? It's haggis. <laughs> what do you do with it? You eat it. Ooh. And so, you know, so, so this is... So the story goes on that Rebecca says, no, 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 bring the two young goats. I'll prepare them the way your papa likes them. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the skins of the goats and I'm gonna stick it up your sleeves and I'm gonna put it on the smooth part of your neck. And so Jacob does that and he goes in before his father and his father Isaac is sitting there and he can smell the food. And, uh, and, and Jacob says, here I am, father, I've brought the food. And he says, wow. How did, you, how did you catch the game and prepare it so quickly? And Jacob says, well, the Lord was with me and gave me favor in the field. And so I've brought it to you. And uh, Isaac says to him, who are you, my son? He says, my name is Esau. And he says, come closer. Let me feel you. When he comes closer, he feels the skin and it's rough and hairy. He says it. The skin is Esau, but the voice is Jacob's. So the Bible says he eats the food. And then one more time, it says to him, are you really Esau, my son? Jacob says, yes, I am. He says, come close to me that I may smell your clothing. And as he comes close, he smells his clothing. He says, it's the smell of my son Esau. Now watch what happens. In verse 27, And he came near and kissed him and he smelled the smell of his clothing and blessed him and said, surely the smell of my son is like the smell of a field which the Lord has blessed. Therefore, may God give you the dew of heaven, of the fatness of the earth and of plenty, plenty of grain and wine. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be master over your brethren and let your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be those who bless you. Watch this. Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from the hunting. He also made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son, excuse me, let my father arise and eat of his son's game. That your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, who are you? He said, I'm Esau, your firstborn. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I, I ate all of it before you came and I've blessed him. And indeed, he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and said to his father, bless me, me also, oh my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered and said to Esau, indeed, I've made him your master. 
and all his brethren I have given to him as servants with grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I now do for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, oh my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. I've been reading the Bible for, like I said, 32 years. And I've always seen this as the negative story that it is. And then just a month ago, as I'm going through my one year Bible, I read this and God speaks to me and he says, do you see how powerful this is? And I'm like, well, it's quite negative. And God says, no, no, no. He says, it's a picture of salvation. It's a picture of the father and it's a picture of Jesus. And if I was honest with you, I'm like this, yeah, I don't think so, God. And then he had to show me. And so I'm going to show that to you tonight, the impossible exchange. So let me just say a couple of quick things. Uh, The Old Testament, in the Old Testament, you and I could attain blessing by what we do. The Old Old Testament was all about the law. It was about keeping the law. If you obey these commands, if you keep my commands says the Lord. If you obey and observe my statutes, then these blessings shall come upon you. The whole Old Testament was about what you did, was about doing. How many people know that your Bible has two parts? You have an Old Testament, you have a New Testament. It wasn't like God kind of, you know, got through the Old Testament and thought, yeah, you know what? Um, Gabriel, this, I got a new idea. We had to have the Old Testament We had to have God's law. The Old Testament is about God revealing His moral law. God had to do that. If I I got pulled over by the cops on the way and the cop goes, listen, I I pulled you over, but I just feel merciful. I'm going to let you off. And I'm like, but I, I wasn't doing anything. Well, you could have been speeding. And if I'm like, well, what's the speed limit here? Well, we don't really have a speed limit. But you know what? Tonight I'm feeling gracious. I think I'll just, I'll just pardon you. I'm like, you ain't pardoning Jack. You're wasting my time. Why did you pull me over? But now if I was doing 180 in a 25 and he pulled me over and I should be going to jail and he pardons me, how many people know I'm going to be incredibly grateful and he showed incredible grace? You, you, you can't have grace unless there's the presence of law. You can't have mercy unless there's the presence of truth. So the reason your Bible has an Old Testament is because God has to show you that no matter how hard we try, no matter how hard I strain and I press and I persevere, I cannot, I cannot attain perfection. I cannot produce the righteousness that allows me entry into heaven. No matter how hard I try, I was born with a sinful nature. I've got four kids. I never had to teach one of them how to lie. They just, they just developed it naturally. I didn't, I didn't have to teach one of them. Now, this is how you don't share. I didn't have to teach one of them. Now, when you get in the car, invade each other's space. And while mum and dad are trying to drive and talk, poke each other so that a fight ensues and you begin to scream in the, he touched me, he touched me, and, and fight while we're driving. Create chaos and havoc in the car. Best to do it on the way to church so that I've got to pull the car over, rip the back door, pull you out and paddle your little backside while I'm waving to people on the way to church. I'm beating my kids. And I'm the pastor. See you in church. Yes, I've got a beating for, no, I don't have a beating for you either. I didn't, I didn't have to teach my children how to throw a tantrum in the, in the Ralph's checkout line. I want candy. I want candy. I didn't have to teach them that. I didn't have to teach. I didn't have to learn how to do wrong. We're born with a sinful nature. So therefore, perfection is something that is impossible. That's the whole reason for the Old Testament. But we have Cain who is sent out into the field to to produce something. Cain is indicative of the Old Testament. Sorry, Esau is indicative of the Old Testament, Esau. Because the Bible says that Isaac loved him because of what he brought from the field, Old Testament. Jacob represents New Testament, unconditional love, unconditional love. Now watch this. 
God wants you to live under His blessing. The blessing of God is, is His Spirit, His anointing. When the anointing is present, natural laws are superseded. When the anointing of God rests on your life, when the blessing of God rests on your life, you can live above natural laws. When Jesus walked on water, he was living above, because the Bible says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. And he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. When Jesus opened the eyes of the blind, he, he, the anointing always supersedes natural laws. When Jesus took five loaves and two fish, Scott Sorensen, and fed the multitudes is because the anointing supersedes natural laws. When we moved from Sydney to San Diego and they said San Diego is a preacher's graveyard, when they said there ain't no spirit-filled churches over 300, when they said you need to understand there's no zoning for churches, you need to understand that the, the buildings are way too expensive and we're just about to buy building five and we're looking at 427 acres out in Campo. I made a decision, I made a decision if I'm, if I'm walking in the anointing, if I'm walking in the blessing of God, I don't have to bow my knee and I don't have to submit to natural laws. You can live above. This is, this is why we came and this is the word for you. This is the good news for you tonight. That you don't have to live with limitations, with ceilings. I remember my mom when I was little saying how in her very thick German accent, life is a struggle. If you watch a baby being born, there's a struggle for the baby to be born. And then life is a struggle. And even death is a struggle. She says it's just a struggle all, all through life. You have negative people that say life is a blank and then you die. And T-shirts with fertilizer happens. And then they use the word fertilizer. <laughs> and people tell you that this is life. The problem is you and I live in a world that is constantly bombarding you with negativity. That's why it's so important to be in the house of God. That's why it's so important to be in the house of God. So the Old Testament was about what you do. The New Testament is about what you believe. The New Testament is about what you believe. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus said to Martha at the tomb of Lazarus, He said, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? When Jesus was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, He came down. The Bible says there was a commotion. And there was a man whose son had epilepsy, seized by a demonic force. And this dark force, this violent force would, would seize him and throw him into the water trying to drown him and, and throw him into fire trying to burn him. His little boy's got, got little burn scars all over him. And he, he brought his boy to Jesus' disciples and they couldn't cast the demon out. So Jesus calls the boy to himself and the, the Bible says the father kneels down before Jesus. He's desperate. And he said, Lord, if you can do anything, please help my son. Watch Jesus' response. He says, if I can do anything, if I can do anything, let me tell you, Jesus knows he can do anything. But he says, it's not about if I can do anything, if you can believe. I know what I can do. I know what I can do. But my power flows towards those who believe. He says, if you can believe, all things are possible for him who believes. And the Bible says, the man on his knees says to him, Lord, I do believe. Please help my unbelief. The reason you're the smartest people in San Diego is because you come to the house of God. Because I don't got to do nothing. I don't got to do nothing to get fear. I don't got to do nothing to get doubt. I don't got to do nothing to get unbelief. It is constantly spewed at me on the airwaves, on the television, the television, in the, the media. So right around the negativity and naysaying and doom and gloom and all the prophets of disaster, the master of disaster. All of that stuff is constantly being, I need to get into the house of God. God. I need to hear the Word of God. I need to hear the promises of God so that my faith can rise. Do you know in the New Testament, in the New Testament, the, the church were called believers. It wasn't until they got to Antioch that they were first called Christians. But even before and after that, the church was always called believers. We're believers. So, so even Abraham, Abraham, the Bible says in Romans 4, 
believed God. The Bible says that he didn't look at the deadness of his own body, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb being 90 years of age, that he believed God for he counted God faithful who had promised. So when they were young, no babies. Now that they are beyond bearing babies, God speaks to him, says, you're gonna have a, a son. Everything in his head, all the naysayers, all the biologists, all the doctors would have been saying to him is impossible. You got rocks in your head. You're crazy. But Abraham made a decision. If God promised it, I'm going to believe it. If God, my job is to bring the promises of God. My job is to preach the word of God so you can bust the lid, so you can shatter the ceiling that is over your life, so you can live a life that is exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think according to the power at work in you. So the New Testament is about believing, believing, believing. The Old Testament is about doing, doing. Now watch this. So I'm perplexed with this story because I'm like, God, this is, I don't understand this. How could this be you? Because Isaac is blind. He can't see. You're a God of vision. Are you trying to tell me that we can deceive you to get into heaven? God uses such powerful pictures. It's almost violent to the text. But once you see this, it's so magnificent. God says, oh, no, no, no. He says, it's the impossible exchange. See, this is what I know. You and I are Jacob. Jacob is born disqualified. How is he born disqualified? The blessing is for the firstborn. He wasn't the firstborn, he was the secondborn. The blessing is on the firstborn. He was born disqualified. David said, I was brought forth in iniquity. You and I were born with a sinful nature. We were born with a bent and a bias away from God. We were born disqualified. Second thing, Jacob does not have the correct covering to approach the father to receive blessing. Sinful man can't stand in the presence of a holy and righteous God. So I do not have the right covering. That's why Jesus had to go to the cross. On the cross, the Bible says, God made him who knew no sin to become sin so that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. The third one is Isaac recognizes the voice. He says, the voice is Jacob's. The voice is Jacob's. In Australia right now, uh, the ATO, the Australian Tax Office, if you call to try and find out how much taxes you owe, you call the, the, the number and you don't speak to a human, you speak to a machine. But they get you to repeat this phrase. And the phrase is, uh, my voice identifies my identity. No, sorry, my voice identifies me. My voice identifies me. And they go, do, 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 do. welcome, Jurgen Mathesius. Thank you. You may be intelligent, but you can't read, obviously. And, and it, it identifies me. Seven billion people, and every single, every single human being has a different voice print. So Isaac recognizes something's fishy. Three times he asks, Are you really? Are you really? Are you really? Now, this is where it gets powerful. Many years ago, I was on a plane. And I just, I was just so impacted and so impressed so with the Ark of the Covenant. So, so I drew a picture of the Ark. And if we can throw that up on the, on the screen. So I drew this picture of the Ark of the Covenant. The Bible says the Ark was uh, acacia wood overlaid inside and outside with gold. And then God gave Moses the instructions. He says, I want you to, to, to make two cherubim out of, out of one lot of gold that face one another over the mercy seat. This here is the mercy seat. And he said, and I will speak to you from between the cherubim. He says, and once a year on Yom Kippur, or the Day of Atonement, he says, the high priest is to go and take a lamb, one year old, perfect, without blemish, and sacrifice it on behalf of the people. And then he's to bring some of the blood, and he's to go into the Holy of Holies. He's to go behind the veil. 
into the very, very presence of the Almighty. And he's to come and he's to place the blood here on the mercy seat. And he says, and behold, when that happens, I will forgive Israel all their sins and I will remember their sins no more. And then he says to Moses, he says, and I will speak to you from between the cherubim. That's where my presence would dwell. And so, so as I'm on the plane, I just kind of drew the glory. And then I saw it was like a cross. And so I put Jesus on there. And then I began to see Jesus on the cross, a thief on the right, thief on the left. And there's a whole nother message in there I won't get into. But watch this. So I began to see the mercy seat. And I began to see the Ark of the Covenant. There are three items in the Ark of the Covenant. The first one is the Ten Commandments. The second one is the pot of manna. You know, the manna that came from heaven, the bread of heaven. The third one is Aaron's rod that had budded. And I thought, oh, they're the three things that God wants in our life. He wants, you know, His laws in our heart. And, you know, He, he wants us to trust Him for provision. And, uh, and He's a God that wants us to trust His leadership. And absolutely those things are true. But God says, no, no, the reason that they're in there is because there were the three violations. There were the three disqualifications for the Israelites from entering into all that God had. Because before Moses even got to the bottom of the mountain, the Israelites had already broken the commandments and Moses had to smash them and then go back up for another 40 days and bring down a second set. And that's the one that's in there. They rejected his leadership. And so they had to bring, bring Aaron. So we have, a, we have this, this tendency to reject God's leadership over our life and become independent and rebellious and do things their own way. And he says, and then, as far as releasing God's supernatural provision, we withhold the tithe and we have a closed window over our lives. And, but God says to me, but it, when, when the blood is there, when the blood is there, it satiates. Now watch this. So Esau is out hunting, Old Testament law. Jacob comes in. Jacob is disqualified, has insufficient covering and his voice gives him away. But Rebecca prepares the food. She's like the Holy Ghost. She prepares the food the way the Father likes it. And she, she gets some of the, 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 the skin of the sacrifice. She gets some of the skin of what's just been slaughtered. And she covers her boy. Because Jesus on the cross, on that cross, He made an exchange. He took your sin and my sin and He became sin. But he made an exchange. He gave you and I his righteousness. That's why she went into the wardrobe and she pulled out Esau's clothing and she clothed him with Esau's clothing so that the father, the voice is Jacob's, but the smell is Esau, the smell of my son. Now, how, how can this be God? Because Isaac is blind. Isaac is blind. So I said, God, this can't be you because Isaac is blind. And God said, I set this whole thing up. It's a picture. And the picture is this, that God will not see through the blood. God will not see through the blood. The Bible says the wages of sin is, come on, the wages of sin is, the blood says somebody died. If, if, if you owed, if you had a bill, if you had a fine for $1,000 and then you go and pay the fine for that person to then come up to you and say, well, you know, you, you still owe me. I still think that you're, you're like, what are you talking about? There was a $1,000 fine and I've paid the $1,000. Get off my back. And if they keep, well, you know, well, no, no, I, I had the, God is so perfect that once the fine is paid, it is forgiven. So God has instituted this incredibly powerful place where Jesus is not just the lamb, but the Bible says he's also the high priest. That when he died on the cross, he entered through the veil into the temple not made with human hands. And he went into the holy of holies in heaven. This is all a shadow and a type of the, the, the picture in heaven. And he went to the very, very mercy seat before the Father and he put his blood there to cover our sin, to cover our unrighteousness, to, to wash away our disqualifications. So now whosoever believes in him, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation so that you and I in Christ, you and I in Christ can now approach the Father. And even though you and I I know that we are disqualified, even though that you and I know that we sin, even though we know that we're jacked up, even though, though we know that we're disqualified.
dysfunction, even though that we know that we're broken, even though, though that we know that there's all kinds of issues in our life, because of Jesus, we can come before the Father, knowing that He recognizes our voice and that our voice disqualifies us. However, when we go before the Father, the blood of Jesus covers all of our sin, all of our iniquity, all of our unrighteousness. So when God smells you, He smells the smell of His Son. When God feels you, He feels the righteousness of Jesus Christ. When God observes you, He brings you in and you and I can have blessing because of what Jesus did. Because of what Jesus did. Beware the preachers that tell you that because of what Jesus did on the cross, you've got to try harder. For years I lived there. Listen to me, for years I lived there as a Christian. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew I struggled with this sin and this sin and this sin. And I'm like, God, I'm never gonna lust again. When I looked at what Jesus did on the cross, when I watched the passion, I'm like, man, He went through all of that for me. That's it, Jesus, I'm never lusting again. Wow. Oh, oh man. <laughs> and you'll hear preachers, Jesus died on the cross because of the sin of humanity. And how can you sin? No one will. <laughs> I'm going to let the cross be my fuel to try harder. The whole point is that you and I cannot produce. We can't produce. Somebody had to sacrifice. When you come believing for the impossible exchange, snaps and breaks the power of sin over your life. Now watch this. I was talking to my handsome son last night and he read a particular book by a particular preacher who can be a little bit severe. He said, Dad, after reading the book, man, I, I felt like I wasn't even saved. And I said, you know, it's interesting. The Bible says through the first man, Adam, because of his disobedience, death came to all men. But because of the second Adam, Jesus, righteous, because of His obedience, righteousness and eternal life came to all men. When you read your Bible, you will find all the way through your Old Testament, they had to do sacrifices. Every seven weeks, there was pretty much a new sacrifice. Once a year, there was where the priest would go in, but it happened, had to happen every year. In fact, Moses said from God, this is to happen in all future generations. Because the sacrifice of a lamb, the sacrifice of a goat, the sacrifice of a bull was only ever temporary because the judgment was greater than the sacrifice. When Elijah went up onto Mount Carmel challenging the prophets of Baal, after they had had their turn and no fire came, the Bible says Elijah took the bull and he cut it into pieces and then he placed it on the altar. And then the Bible says he poured water on it one time, poured water on it two times, poured water on it three times. And then he cried out to God. And the Bible says the fire of God fell from heaven, consumed the bull, consumed the wood of the altar and licked up all the fire. Why is that? Because the judgment was greater than the sacrifice. Until Jesus. Until Jesus. When Jesus Christ... The Lamb of God was nailed to the cross. The Bible says the darkness came over the land from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, from 12 p.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. Darkness came over the whole land because God was extracting the sins of humanity, your sin and my sin, and placing it on His Son, Jesus. And then the Bible says at 3 p.m., Jesus on the cross cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli. Lama Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because it was that, at that moment, for the first time in Jesus' life, He felt the separation. He felt the Father tear Himself away because God cannot be yoked to sin. And so the Father turns His back on Jesus Christ as the wrath of God comes upon Jesus' body on the cross. And Jesus in agony is on the cross. But watch this. He doesn't die there. He doesn't die until these words leave His lips. 
Once the full judgment and the full wrath of God comes upon Jesus, he says, it is finished. It was the first time in human history that the sacrifice was greater than the judgment. It was the first time in history the sacrifice was greater than the judgment. To believe anything less is to say that Adam's sin, Adam's mess up in the garden is more powerful than Jesus' obedience, than Jesus' sacrifice and Jesus' crucifixion. That's a lie from the pit of hell, my friend. I got to tell you, what Adam lost in the garden, Jesus recovered on the cross. Jesus recovered on the cross. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. He is the sinless. He is the blameless. He is the spotless. He is the righteous son of the living God. And he died on a cross in your place and my place so that in Christ... I can go before the Father knowing I'm disqualified, knowing my voice says that I was born disqualified, but I can go before the Father and because of the blood of Jesus, He doesn't see my sin. He doesn't see my disqualification. He does all He sees is blessing. He reaches out His hand and blesses me. I don't deserve it. It's His goodness. This is His plan. This is His plan. This is the good news. This is what we preach. The impossible exchange. I'm going to heaven not because of me. I live in blessing not because of me. That's why the Bible says if you read Revelation, it says when they stand before Jesus, they take their crowns. The apostle Paul says, man, I'm I'm not far from departing. I know that my, my death is imminent. He says, and there is laid up for me a crown. God has got a crown for you being faithful. But then you fast forward to Revelation. The Bible says they're in front of Jesus, the Lamb. And the Bible says they bow their knee and they take their crowns and they cast their crowns before Him. They cast their crowns before Him because they know the only reason we were able to do what we did was because of You. That's why they sing the song of the Lamb. That's why we're so passionate. Oh, I don't think I like this church. They're all down the front, like all hyped up, aren't they? Look at them, they've got their hands lifted and they're jumping. I don't think you should be jumping in church, Marsha. I don't know if I agree with jumping in church. Oh, I think it's all hype, isn't it? Look at him. Look at him go. Look at him. When you see, when you recognize what Jesus did, when you recognize that you are disqualifying and because of what he did on the cross, because of what he did on the cross, The blessing of God, the favor of God, the promises of God, the goodness of God, the loving kindness of God, the healing. Friend, there ain't nothing like Him. There's nobody like Him. Come on, one more time, give God a great shout. Come on. Come on. Come on, just thank Him right now. Thank Him right now. Come on, take 10 seconds and just thank God for the impossible exchange. Thank Him for the impossible exchange. We bless you, Lord. We magnify you. Lord, we exalt you. We bless you. Hallelujah. Stay standing. Stay standing. We're we're out of time. I'm going to have the band lead us in in a closing song, but I want to pray for people. If your life's not right with God, man, don't keep fighting against the curse. Don't keep struggling. Don't keep letting the devil rob from your life. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Jesus died on a cross not to start a new religion. He died on a cross to take away all your sin, all your shame, all your guilt, so that you could have not only everlasting life, but life more abundant right here and now. So if you know tonight you need to rededicate, if you know tonight you need to surrender, if you know tonight you need to give your life to Jesus, would you just give me a wave and I'm going to pray for you as I close the service. Just lift your hand high and say, hey, pastor, that's me. I need to come to God. I need to come back to God. I need to surrender to God. Who are those ones? Just lift your hand up high. Lift your hand up high. Thank you. Thank you. Who else is there? Thank you through there. Who else is there? Lift it up high. Thank you through there. Who else there? Thank you over there, sweetheart. Who else there? Thank you up there. Thank you. Still others. Quick. Quick. I know I'm out of time, but I want to pray for you tonight. The great exchange. Don't leave here in your righteousness. Don't leave here in your rags. You don't have to leave the same way you came in. Is there someone else? Is there someone else? Thank you. Anybody else? Quickly. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Anybody else? Quickly, just lift your hand. I am out of time. Thank you, young man. I see your hand. Thank you. Man, I I feel this. some people. It's like the world is tugging on your heart. The devil's a liar. He'll, He'll tell you, man, if you give your life to God, sin's fun. You won't be able to sin anymore. I got to tell you, the greatest thing I ever did was gave my life to Jesus Christ. The wages of sin is death. It may taste good at first, but it's bitterness in your your soul. The greatest thing I ever did was made a decision to give my life to Jesus. I got to tell you, the devil's a liar and God is good. Is it just one more person says, hey, tonight? I need to make that choice. Tonight, I need to make that decision. Tonight, I'm crossing the line. Tonight, come hell or high water. Thank you. Thank you. Tonight, I'm I'm, I'm going all out for God. Thank you, sweetie. Tonight, that's it. That's it. That's it. I'm done. I'm done living for this world. I'm done living for myself. Thank you. Thank you. Who else is there? Who else is there? Come on, just make that decision. Tonight is my night. I'm crossing the line tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This is what we're going to do. Those of you that raise your hands, and there were so many of you, I'm going to ask you to do something. Just would you grab a friend? I'm, I'm going to get down off this platform. I'm going to stand down here. And I'd love to shake your hand. I'd love to pray for you personally. If you're sitting with someone that raised their hand, would you bring them? If you're sitting with someone who needed to raise their hand, and I didn't give them enough time, would you still bring them? If you've got a friend that you brought to church tonight that you know needs to respond, would you bring them? Church, let's put our hands together and up the back on the sides. Would you begin to come? Just grab your friend. Begin to come. Come on, let's put our hands together. People coming from the back, from the sides. Come on, some of my team, help them, help them come. Come on, help them come. Come on, people coming from everywhere. Come on, just say, excuse me, I'm going down. Excuse me, I'm coming out. Come on, come on. Come on, can we give these people a great round of applause? I know I've gone a few minutes over. I'm going to lead them in a prayer, and then the band's going to f- finish this clothing, close out song. But this is what I want you to do tonight. After I pray this prayer, as we sing these words, just lift your hands tonight and, and sing these songs. It's such a beautiful song. Sing the words. And just allow, allow God to get rid of that striving, the guilt, the shame, the condemnation. Listen to me. I've seen the other gospel, the other gospel that says, because Jesus died on a cross, you ought to just try harder. You know what it produces? It produces hypocrisy. Because I've got to pretend like I've got it all together. I've got to pretend like I don't even struggle with sin anymore. But when I realize that I can never produce the righteousness God, somebody had to sacrifice it's amazing how it breaks the power of sin. It's amazing how it, God imparts righteousness. So you have righteousness on the inside of you. Pride says, I'll do it my way. Humility says, somebody has to rescue me. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. So I want you who have come forward, let's all say these words. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you tonight. You so love me. Jesus Christ, your only son, died on a cross to break the power of sin. Wash me clean so that tonight I am forgiven. Tonight I am a child of God. I am clothed in righteousness. It is the gift of God because of the impossible exchange. Lord Jesus, tonight I declare I am your servant from this moment forward. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us online. We hope you had a powerful experience. We wanna take this time to personally help you navigate the next steps in becoming connected. 
If you made a decision for Christ today, need prayer, or want more information about our church, go to our website, c3sandiego.com. And if you didn't get a chance to give online during service and would like to contribute financially, you can go to c3give.com and click on the giving option that works best for you. We look forward to hearing from you. See you at church.